Cuidando el futuro de la energía, acceso para todos y protección del medio ambiente. Dr. Helge Haldorsen, Senior Fellow Switch, Energy Alliance. El señor Helge es director ejecutivo de Witchman WHN M Advisory, fue vicepresidente de Relaciones con Inversionistas de Equinor, director, director general de Statoil México y vicepresidente de Estrategia y Cartera de Statoil Norteamérica. Se desempeñó en la Junta Directiva de la Conferencia de Tecnología Offshore durante cinco años y actualmente se desempeña en la Junta Asesora Externa de la Escuela de Ingeniería de Cochrane. Ha dado conferencias magistrales frecuentes sobre la industria de EIP por lo, a lo largo de su carrera y la Sociedad Estadounidense de Ingenieros Mecánicos, ASME, le otorgó el premio al liderazgo de la industria del petróleo Rhodes 2013. Adelante, bienvenido. Thank you very much and good morning everybody. It's still buenos dias, not tardes. Thank you for inviting me to beautiful Cartagena to discuss Colombia's energy future with special focus on the role of natural gas going forward. Of course, Cartagena is also La Heroica, looking back to 1811 independence and 1815. And I think you'll agree that both independence and energy transition will take heroic efforts. So, in preparation for my talk, I read the 32-page consultation document put together by Naturgas, and I think you have read it too, and it is very impressive. I called it Un Mapa Energético Heroico para el Futuro. And if you look at it, they have a compass with three, sorry, four E's around And that is focusing on energy for all and environmental protection. And that's exactly what we have to do. We have to do both things. And the gas can help us do this, as we have talked about in this conference. And then we have to see how this becomes part of Colombia's plan going forward to 2050. It's important to have a dream for the future. And, and your great writer, Gabriel García Márquez says, it's not true that people stop pursuing dreams because they grow old. They grow old because they stop pursuing dreams. October 5 was the start of this conference, and I love history, and any time I speak, I look at what happened on this date. Look at hero in heroica, and I thought, do we have any heroes on October 5? It's a sad one, because we lost Steve Jobs on October 5, 2011, but we did not lose some of his quotes. You have to be burning with an idea or a problem or a wrong that you want to write. And that's exactly what we want to do. And what's, what is creativity? It's just connecting things. So let's be curious and collect things to connect during the rest of the Congress, as we have done so far. This is a lady in South Sudan. She has spent five hours collecting wood and dung to make food for the family. Look at the fumes hitting her face. She cannot go to school because she has to be home to work. And we want zero people on the planet to have this type of life. I think you agree. At the same time, and we've talked about this in the conference in every section, we are trying to do for the globe an energy transition. We are trying to go from higher emissions to lower emissions. But right now, of course, fossil fuels is behind 82% of the, of the, of the energy uh, that we are using. So the goal for the planet is to be below plus 1.5, as we've talked about. But we have to do both these things. We can't just focus on one and not the other. And the number is always staggering to me. How many people do we have on the planet? 
of the 7.9 billion people who have a difficult time because they need clean, affordable, and reliable energy. We're talking about 2.6 billion people, right? So that's why I call this talk the dual challenge facing every nation and the world right now, energy access for all and environmental protection. I wanted the first letters to add up to switch because that's what we have to do. I'm going to talk about spaceship Earth because we are on a planet moving around. And many of the people on the planet are, you know the expression, worlds apart. We are getting closer, but it's very slowly so. So we have to intensify pollution and emission reduction while teaming up to deliver affordable and sustainable energy for all. It's important to have critical thinking and a civil dialogue to find compromises because it's a very difficult thing to do. And then at the end, we'll go to the home stretch and the takeaways. But first, the big picture. And then the details. So here we are. That little blue number three from the sun, that's you right now. We are moving around the sun at 107,000 kilometers an hour. I'm not kidding. That is the speed that you have right now. And that is 40 times the speed of a bullet leaving a gun. That is your speed now. If you send up an astronaut in space, regardless of political persuasion, they get what's called the overview effect. They look back at the planet and they get the feeling of awe for this spaceship going around, right? They got, get a strong sense of responsibility for everybody. So my job now is that for the next 30 minutes, I want to turn you into astronauts so that you have this feeling looking back on planet Earth. This is my proxy of spaceship Earth. This, this helps me to think in a little different way. So this is planet Earth. And on deck, you have 195 nations adding up to 7.9 billion people. And they are all under a leaky dome. You know, CO2 and, and methane will escape, but it takes hundreds of years once you send it out, right? Many do not have what we take for granted. Many of them lack affordable and reliable energy. And everybody has a grave concern about local pollution and for the planet when it comes to climate change. So what does all head of nations want? We heard the president of Colombia yesterday. He wants human flourishing for all 52 million in Colombia and no poverty. He wants energy security. He wants clean air, land, and water. On the planet today, we have 215 million companies. Some of them are members of Naturgas. So now I put the flag of Colombia next to the flag of my country, Norway, because as you know, we are two very friendly nations uh, going forward. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a while. So who is the captain on this ship? We need a reliable global authority that is respected, and I think you'll agree that the UN and the IPCC, many are trying to be that reliable captain of spaceship Earth. But let's look first at what's happening in the atmosphere under that leaky dome. Here you see CO2 emissions since 1750, up to almost 37 billion tons in 2020, and it's still increasing. You see the rich nations, they are going down, Europe and North America. You see Asia, because of population growth and economic development, look how much of it is coming from Asia. And then focus on Africa and South America, a tiny part of emissions are coming from those two big continents, right? If you look at the cumulative CO2 emissions, this is what you see. We have emitted 1.5 trillion tons under the dome. You see the top three is the big ones contributing. Africa, 3%, and South America, only 3%. IPCC, the last year and a half, put together three reports that summed up the state of things when it comes to the atmosphere. 
Greenhouse gases up, temperature up, extreme weather up, poverty and pollution still there, and we are not on a trajectory to deliver on the Paris Agreement. And this made, of course, the chief of the UN say, this is a code red. We have to really do something. And that was the input to COP26 in Glasgow, as you recall. And the takeaway from all that was that human-induced climate change, poverty and pollution, affect the lives of billions of people. Those least able to cope are the hardest hit and will be so going forward. Four or five lack affordable and clean energy, and we are too slow to act to do the right thing. But we, it's still possible to deliver. Now we are ready for COP27 in Egypt, where all the nations will come back with new goals for emissions reductions. Not everybody agrees with this alarmist view. Somebody is saying, like this guy with false alarm, Bjorn Lomborg, a very respected scientist, how climate change panic costs us trillions, hurt the poor, and fails to fix the planet. He is saying we have to do a lot more R&D on renewable, get the cost down, and then everybody will stop using coal, oil, and gas. So that's his take. Then you have... Uh, a guy who was, uh, he is a professor, he was in the Obama administration, Mr. Kuhlman. He is calling his book Unsettled. He is saying there's a lot of uncertainty about how damaging the climate change really will be. So if we don't do 1.5, we come in at 2.5. You know, many books are saying that's the end of the world. And he says, well, that's not settled. So I just wanted to have both sides of the argument with you. One saying this is code red, others saying something else. Meanwhile, spaceship Earth is going on to 2050, right? So what is happening between now and 2050? We heard it in the previous session, we're adding 2 billion people. We're going to be 10 billion people in 2050. We add 75 million people per year. One and a half Columbia coming in addition every single year. Energy demand will go up 50%. The global middle class, those with more money to purchase things, they grow with 140 million per year. Number of cars will double. Percent of us living in cities go up. And look at the last one. We, we will add a New York City per month the next 40 years to keep up with the population growth. Isn't that unbelievable? We've all been to New York. And that's quite the job. In economic terms, what does it mean? If you add up the GDP of 195 nations, it's about $100 trillion today, right? And we are running the world on 80% fossil fuels. 100 million barrels per day, 400 billion cubic feet of gas per day, and about 20 million tons of coal per day. That's how we run the machine today. And then in 2050, they predict the world economy will double, more than double, and now we have an ambition of be net zero, right? Think of what we have to do to get from the top one to that one while we double the GDP of the globe. It took us 200 years to build today's energy system, and then we have now 28 years to change everything to become net zero. What is the price tag? Many estimates are out there, but between four to nine trillion dollars per year globally to 2050. Meanwhile, back to our friend in South Sudan. She has no safe and reliable energy, no smartphone, no computer, no TV, no clean water and hot shower and toilet like I had this morning at the wonderful Hotel Bastion in Centro Historico. I want to dig a little bit deeper. Look at this number. We have more than 700 million people, one in 10, that lack safe water. 1.4 billion do not have access to a loo, as they say in the UK. So, and then no car and no appliance. So if you look at these two next to each other, income level one up to the rich nations on income level four, and you look at kind of two people living there, 
this could kind of be me, I guess, in Norway over here, looking at my iPad, and I have everything I need. And this is our friend then in South Sudan. If we ask Sanu Kanji, what is your top priority? She would probably pick the two yellow, right? If you ask me in Hotel Bastion or back in Oslo, maybe I will pick the one on top because I have everything else, right? This is why it's so important to do both things. So how can we help Sanju Kanji? Anything is better than what she's doing now, right? LPG is a huge improvement, right? What if she was connected to the gas grid? What if she even had electricity from coal compared to her condition now? Or from nuclear, or from gas, or solar, local grid, or windmill? Anything we can do along that chain will make it greener and greener. So maybe we don't start with renewable, but anything is better than what she has today. And if you live in region two and three for income, you want reliable power. I have friends in Bangladesh and other countries. Power is almost gone every day. You have 40 degrees Celsius, no air conditioning, you can't even sleep, right? Very unreliable electricity. What do we have to do over here? We have to cut emissions. I don't know if you read this book, but if you haven't, go to Amazon.com and buy Factfulness. I read it recently, and it kind of changed my perspective on many things. He has a few passages about climate change that I wanted to share with you. He is saying, most of the CO2 accumulated during the last 50 years by countries that are now on income level four. So they use coal and other things to get there. And now, of course, they don't use coal. So the rich nations took us all in this delicate situation. But we can't blame anyone retrospectively for harm they were unaware of. From now on, though, we count CO2 emission per capita. So let's look at that. Here is CO2 emission per capita. US, 14.4 ton per American. There are 330 million Americans. China, half, 7.1. South America, 2.1 on the average. And Africa, 0.7. And the global average is 4.8. So climate change, don't get me wrong, is super important, like the president said yesterday. But it's not the only thing that is important. And then I want to talk a little bit about the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. And they are very often under the radar, as you know. So here they are. We put them up in 2015. We hope to deliver on them in 2030. And they are all fantastic. If you could look at number two, Zero Hunger, that the F FAO guy that we heard earlier in the panel is working on. And of course, we are working on affordable and clean energy, number seven, and so on. But they're all very important. If you want to really see what life is like without energy, and you have one hour to spare one day, look at this. So I work for a non-profit organization called switchon.org. My boss, Dr. Tinker, has been to many nations to see the lives they have, and they put it into this movie. So that, that will give you a fantastic opportunity to see what it's like if you didn't know already. So here is the distribution of income across the world. You see the blue club is not that big. It's kind of OECD plus a little more, 1.5 billion people of 8 billion. And then you see the level 3, level 2, and level 1. And then let's look at the clean air map across the world. And look where it's green. That tells you that the blue nations that are rich, they can afford to clean up, right? So they are green on this map, while the others are not able to do that. So there's a relationship as we would have expected. So what is this pollution inside houses and outside in many cities doing? The recent study that came out says that 9 million people a year dies from indoor and outdoor pollution. I thought I should compare that to the aggregate number of people who died from COVID in two and a half years. And that's 6.5 billion, right? 
So 9 million a year versus that one. So back to indoor pollution. Here are the numbers. We talked about them already. Totally unacceptable. And this is the number of people dying in, inside because of the fumes. And I call that code red. We have to do something. What does it cost to do something? It costs about 40 billion a year to 2030, and that's about 1% of the average annual energy sector investment. We can afford that, right? Now let's go outside. Many cities in the world are like this, and the latest estimates is that 4.5 million people a year die from this type of pollution, and you see where it's coming from below. And I think you agree with me, another code red. We can't have so many people die prematurely because of outdoor pollution. Now let's talk quickly about energy sources. We started with biomass back before 1800. Then we had coal, then we had hydro, then we had oil, then we had gas, then we had nuclear, then we had geothermal, and then we had wind and solar and tidal and geothermal and a few other things. But it's not an energy transition, it's an energy addition. And we keep using more of everything, right? We don't go from A to B, we're adding B and adding C and adding D, and then we use more of them all as we go forward. So right now, this just came out from BP, 82% of primary energy came, comes from oil, gas and coal, if you look at renewable that we hope to run the world on in 28 years, it's now 4.6% from wind and solar. And if you add in everything, it's at 67 And below that, you see hydro and nuclear. So we don't predict the future, but I, I took something from the IEA and my old company, Equinor, that I used to work for before. You are familiar with the net zero from IEA. And they are saying that to reach net zero, we have to cut gas by 50, oil by 75, and coal by 90% in order to come in at 1.5. It's a back cost, not the forecast. We don't need any more oil and gas fields, and we don't need exploration, according to this report from the IEA. If we go to Equinor, they are saying they have two scenarios. They have one called Walls, the black one, small incremental changes like we see today, and then they have bridges, which is a radical change scenario that takes the world to below 1.5. But look at the error bar. Look at the difference between the two, right? And nobody quite know where we will end. So this is the type of uncertainty that the previous panel talked about. It's a huge uncertainty. One has a peak in 25, and one has a peak in 41, and nobody is sure. It depends on policy, technology, consumer behavior, and many other things. So a couple of words about gas. Most scenarios on gas says that it will play a very important role in the transition. It lowers emission a lot compared to coal, and many governments want to reduce fossil fuel, but they like the way gas can be a base load up against renewable, like sun and wind. Because gas is there when we have a drought, so hydro is not so good, no wind, no solar, well, then we have gas. And if you put CCS on it, then of course emissions are zero as well. What about oil? These are the two scenarios for oil. Right now we produce about 100 million barrels a day. And look at the estimates in 2050, almost the same, just down 19 million barrels, right? But look at the other one, we're down to 25 million barrels a day. And the big one taking us down is that we go from internal combustion engine cars to EVs. EVs need batteries. This is a Tesla battery stack. Let's look at batteries. This one needs 7,000 batteries. Today we have 1.4 billion cars. If half of them were electric, that's 700 million cars. Then we need 4.9 billion batteries. That means we need 250,000 batteries per minute for 37 years. If you are like me, I'm thinking that, that's quite the tall order to deliver on, right? And where do we get the stuff 
that the batteries need. It was addressed earlier in two panels, but one EV battery like this is more than 500 kilo. Look at what you need with lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, and so on, right? It adds up that you have to do mining of about 200 tons just for one battery, right? Somebody called this, why do we destroy the planet to save the planet, right? Here you see the difference between an electric car and a conventional car. It needs six times more. And if you look at minerals for other things, you see gas is on the bottom, and offshore wind and solar are on top, right? Need an enormous amount of minerals compared to what we have done before. So that means the demand for these metals are going to be huge, some up to more than 40 of what we use today. And where are they? And very few in Colombia, maybe you have uh, possibilities that you need to develop, but look at this one, where are they processed? Look at those percentages, right? That's kind of putting all your eggs in one basket, as we talked about earlier. Nothing wrong with China, but that's not diversification. So we're seeing a complete rethink now of the supply chain. Should we start doing more in the country? Should we diversify to get two or three rather than just one? Should we team up? We heard about regional integration earlier today, and I think that's a good one. You make kind of a metal NATO, right? And an electric power NATO that five nations team up and do much better together. This is a huge debate going on in every country right now. I wanted to give you this cute example, going from horse to car. There's something called the Great Horse Manure Crisis of 1894. Cities were drowning in horse manure. In London, there were 50,000 horses. In New York, 100,000 horses. And they put a million pounds of horse manure on the street every day. And the Times of London were writing, in 50 years, every street in London would be buried under nine feet of manure. It seemed like Civilization was doomed. We can't live in cities. But look what happened. This is a picture of Fifth Avenue in 1900. I called it Spot the Car. Thousands of horses and just one car. And then look at the same street just 13 years later. Now we say Spot the Horse, right? Isn't it amazing? Just in such a short time we can do this. This is equivalent to Ekern's demonstration of transport with coal how quickly we could do it, right? So I said, what a difference only 13 years can make. And why did it happen? Here he is, Henry Ford. He was the green solution to the horse manure crisis. He came up with innovative technology, the assembly line, that produced low cars, low cost cars that people could afford. What other things are kind of levers or drivers for things to change? It is, of course, when going green is cheaper than not going green, like heat pumps, if you have good and affordable clean electricity, policy regulations like CO2 tax, incentives with tax breaks, and then the consumer behavior from companies, circular economy, and low carbon foods for you and me. These are other things that make stuff accelerate. What about companies like Ecopetrol and companies like Equinor in Norway? What is ENP 2.0? How do they have to change? Well, they have to optimize in a different way. And we heard it already from Felipe, the CEO of Ecopetrol. They are working on cutting scope one and two. That is uh, eliminate leaks, stop venting and flaring, electrify operations. Some even include scope three, and they want to become net zero. So that's on top of the agenda for companies. And then they are looking for what they call advantage basins to explore in. It has to be good potential. It needs to be renewable nearby. Look at the solar next to the pumps. Maybe we need to be able to inject uh, CO2. Maybe we can make hydrogen. And then we have to have low cost oil, advantage barrels, right? With low carbon intensity, kilo CO2 per barrel produced, and a low break even. And then finally, we want to try to avoid geopolitical risk. So that's the one slide I have on ENP 2.0.
when it comes to what happens in the companies, they need to be digital and high-tech. There are sensors on all the well so we can remotely see what's going on. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and automation. That is exciting for young people to join this type of industry. And then somebody told me to include my prediction of the oil price. This is my prediction of the oil price to 2050 from today. It's going to go up and down. I don't even know where we are today. Are we here? And then like Eckern said, heading for 100 by Christmas. Or maybe we are over here. Sorry, so we have a long cycle. Maybe we really are on the way down, so rice dye is wrong. So basically, this is the nature of commodities. It's, it will be boom and bust all the way to 2050. So we have to be fit at 50, fit at 40. The company needs to survive at a low price that could last for some time. Okay, accelerating emission reduction. So here we see the countries again that we dealt with earlier. And now we're looking at how are the continents doing when it comes to the different fuels. And then I make it proportional to how many people live there. And now look at Asia with coal and oil, right? And then you see South America with half of it renewable and hydro and what have you. The same with North America. And then many people say we have to use, stop using oil and coal immediately. Look what happens to 4.9 billion people in, in Asia, right? And some don't like gas and nuclear either. We heard that earlier that some are against that. Well, this is what we have left then, everybody. Can we run the world on this? Of course we can, right? So what is the problem? The problem is energy density. The energy density is very high for coal, oil, nuclear, and natural gas, and very low for those over there, right? We call it renewable and fossil, some intermittent and reliable, and we often see in the press clean and dirty, very binary, right? So here is coal. Coal is behind 36% of electricity generated today. And if we want to reach one and a half, we have to cut coal consumption to zero by 2040. So I want to do a little exercise with you. I want to look at how many windmills and solar panels do we need if they are to produce 10, 0, 4, or 2 terawatt hours like coal did. So let's have a look. In order to produce the same windmills, we need 650,000. And now I'm using the capacity factor and the size, the average size of windmills. So we need 420 offshore windmills a week for 50 years or 21,000 a year. Offshore wind is bigger, but we almost have nothing of it yet. How many solar roofs do we need? 660 million. So that's 36,000 roofs a day for 50 years, if you use the average size. Of course, solar farms are bigger, so that's going to help a bit. What do we do with them typically now? Is this very renewable? We bury them, right? Very little recycling. So. We can have environmental effects. We talked about the mining. We need to recycle, and that's the same on the other side. I decided to check how many windmills did we install in 21, and we actually installed 30,000, and that's more than the 21,000 we had to, to be cutting coal. Nuclear energy is coming up more and more in many nations. If you look at greenhouse gas emission and the death rate, it's, it's almost a winner, even including Fukushima and Chernobyl. And this book is just to take the other side of the argument. Robert Bryce is a distinguished guy with written, I think, nine books. Renewables are not green. CCS won't work. Fuels of the future are, you like this one, natural gas and nuclear. That's his conclusion after a long book, right? I think we can agree we want to turn on the light for everyone, including her in South Sudan. And now a little bit about Norway and Colombia. You beat us by a factor of 10 when it comes to people. We beat you when it comes to oil production. We beat you on gas production, but you are doing much better on CO2 per capita. This is, uh, 
this is not good for Norway to have almost 4.3 more per capita than you have. Camille wanted me to say a little bit about what we do in Norway on EMP. Here you see we have all offshore, and the goal is to monetize the resources to maximize value. But the two in red is the secret behind Norway's success. Sufficiently attractive and competitive investor tech so that you get in risk capital and players, and you have to demonstrate stable and predictable frame conditions with changing governments, right? Because ENP is a 30-year business. You spend billions today, and then you earn it back over the next 30 years, right? So that is the success behind Norway. We have many pipelines to Europe. 50% of UK's gas is coming from Norway, and about 25% of EU's gas demand is coming from Norway. A couple of numbers, we have 36 ENP companies on the shelf. They spend between 17 and 20 billion per year. Lots of domestic employment because of it, about 200,000. You see the exploration spend. And, the, and what we call the sovereign fund of Norway is now the biggest in the world, with one trillion dollar in the bank. So that has been a huge success. And what's the, uh, yeah, so I had the celebration of 50 years the state of Norway owns 67% of Equinor. And I hope I'm right that the state owns 88.5% of Ecopetrol. But they are older than us, 20 years older. What is NCS 2.0, the Norwegian Continental Shelf? It's more exploration, field development, improved oil recovery, electrification, offshore wind. Now we have wind supplying power to offshore platforms. Blue Hydrogen and CCS 2.0 as a business. We are, the, the companies in Germany are sending CO2 to Norway for a price for us to inject it. So that's a little bit about what's going on in Norway. Almost done. So we think that critical thinking and civil dialogue is very important. Energy is a very complex thing, full of dilemmas, never binary. We have to find trade-offs and compromises. Uh, when you navigate energy, you must be objective and factually complete and look at the full life cycle of what's happening. There are pros and cons with all types of energy. Of course, sun, solar and wind are not renewable, even if sun and wind are, as I've showed you with all the metals. The energy mix will transition slowly and at different speeds in different countries, and a wise transition must address both economic and environmental needs. So quick takeaways then. How do we get from A to B? We need ed energy education because it's that complex, right? You can't just read and Google a couple of things and then you make a decision. And young people today, 10 years, they're going to be 25 and 37 and then they're running Norway and Colombia. Next, critical thinking and civil dialogue. Courage in politics and ingenuity in policy because there will be, have to be compromises. R&D and innovation and incremental improvement of everything we do, and government and business collaboration is super important for efficiency, speed, and scale. And then our behavior as a company, as a business, as a bank, all this is super important. And then global solidarity. The rich nations have to help those with not much money. And finally, on the bottom, we need a diverse energy mix because it boosts security and resilience. So, no simple solutions. It's all solvable if we act together. Let's not leave anyone behind, particularly not our friend in South Sudan. I know that this is what you do. You help in Colombia make available affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy. So you have the right to put this in your CV when you describe what you do for a living. I'm changing the world for the better. I'm changing Colombia for the better. So this is Camillo and me. We, we were here in Cartagena 11,000 years ago. We had a beard sitting by the fire. And Camillo says, Helge, look at that beautiful moon. I wish we could go there. And I said, Camillo, are you crazy? We can't go to the moon. All we have is flint arrowheads, which is true. That was the most high-tech on the planet at that time. But then we did, right? It's unbelievable when you see those two next to each other. But it takes leadership, big dreams, and a vision for the future. 
And I think we have that. So I think we can do energy for all and environmental protection and erase together the im so that it is possible. No, I get music. The future is not a gift, it's an achievement, right? You know this song. So with that, a picture from Norway, thank you so much.